welcome to another exciting episode of the Andre the Beast Creighton Show. I'm your host, Andre the Beast Creighton. Today is a beautiful Saturday. We got guests coming in all day long. I'm excited. But I'm even more excited about the guests that we have on now by way of Zoom. All the way from Naples, Brooklyn's Girl. Hey, Andre, how are you? Lorraine Geraci here. Thank you so much for having me on your show today. Hey, no problem. So we talked last night, so much information. Tell the viewers a little bit about you. Thank you. Well, I am not only a learning and development professional and a mortgage consultant and coach for a lot of personal professional development, I'm also the author of Living a Rockstar Life, and I'm also in the process of writing two more books on totally different subjects that I'm very excited about as well. Let's start right now with the first book. What led us into that book before we get into the second book? So Living a Rockstar Life, I started writing in the early 2000s. It took me forever to write it. And one of the reasons I wanted to be uh, because I was talking to a lot of different people professionally, personally, and I found that so many people were complaining and always looking at the negative side of things or reasons why they weren't able to obtain something or they were not having the life that they wanted. So I put together Living a Rockstar Life to put my spin on how to get out of your own way and focus on things that are important to you so that way you can be happier and have the life that you really want to have. What were some of the things that was important to you that actually led you down that? When we talked last night, there was a series of of incidents. Mm -hmm. And don't we won't say incidents as bad things that happened, but let's just say there was a whole lot of life experiences that you found out at a young age take the viewers down there yeah so you know growing up in the state of new york you know i had such a great family life in childhood it was really wonderful i had some wonderful friends too as i started getting older and getting into the professional part of my life both you know sometimes personally with family members and friends but Often in my professional life, I found that so many people were walking around with their heads hung low. They were unhappy. They were always complaining about things. And it started to really gnaw at me. And I recognized it as I got older and got into more of the professional mindset. Why is everybody so down? Mm -hmm. You know, and I was always looked at as this perky, positive person, very different from a lot of people, very unusual. What and also very unusual and perky. Yeah. What what kind of what what do you mean by that? Well, you know what people think if you're happy most of the time or you're positive that something's wrong, you're hiding something, right. or that there's you know they just don't look at people that are kind of on a level ten most of the time, not all the mm -hmm. time, as you know being a bad thing or not you know uh, uh, true to themselves or you know really kind of hiding something, which was not the case at all. I just. I had this spirit about me that I wanted to share with everybody else. And most of the time it worked, but sometimes it didn't. And I found that people were kind of like pushed away from me because they felt the sun was too bright, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, I, and I realized I had to learn as I got older, I'm not everybody's cup of tea and that's okay. It used to bother me when I was a kid. And as I got older, I'm okay with it because thankfully it's not a lot. And I, and I dealt with that. And that's what made me write the book. I wanted to give my experience through my life at that time. I became a professional coach. I also uh, worked in a corporate environment that allowed me the opportunity to grow with team members and some really great people. And I wrote the book, it's pretty short, it's under 100 pages, to really give people an understanding of, here's how I took it upon myself to really focus on the positive things, manifesting the life that I wanted to have, and taking action and making decisions to get there rather than having a woe is me moment all the time. How, how, where was, tell me a little bit about your, your, your foundation with your mom, your dad, your siblings. You, you said you were looked at a little bit different, you know, so yeah. take us into that dimensions, into that household in the Brooklyn, New York area. 
<laughs> well, funny enough, I lived in Brooklyn for about six months, right? And that's funny. I always joke around about people. I said, hey, I got tired of the place, kind of got out. Um, I was adopted when I was six months old from Brooklyn. I was born in Brooklyn and moved to the Hudson Valley of New York with my family, mom and dad. And I had an adopted younger brother. And as time went on, my folks divorced and remarried and I had more siblings. And I consider myself a pretty lucky kid because my family grew uh, from those experiences. And thankfully, everybody got along. There wasn't anything, you know, horrible to discuss. And I just had such an extended family. And that's how I grew to be that family is not always blood, not just because I was adopted. And so is my brother, but I had step siblings that I am so close to to this day. Mm -hmm. And we grew up together. And, you know, Christmases are pretty cool, right? We, I, I got a variety of different places to go and, and share my life with so many different people. But even throughout all that, Andre, I always felt like, you know, even though I know I'm loved very much to this mm -hmm. day, I think a lot of my family members looked at me like, gosh, you're a little, she's a little out there. Um, <laughs> you know, very, very positive and, you know, bouncy for lack of better words. And, you know, that wasn't always looked at as maybe um, a good thing. Sometimes people think, well, if you're like that, you don't care about what's going on. Or, you know, I don't watch the news. I don't allow negative things to, to bother me too much. I'm human because I kind of let it roll off me most of the time. And sometimes people think that that's, well, you don't care, you're burying your head in the sand, or you don't want to know about what's going on uh, in the world and things of that nature. And I'm like, mm, no, that's not true. It's I don't choose to allow it to kind of get inside of me and you know take on that negativity because what happens is it affects me. And then it also affects all the people that I am around, whether it's friends, work-related folks or family members. and. You know, sometimes people look at that as, you know, being unique, different and and, and not the norm, I guess. When, I you're, guess. when you're when the individuals around you and yourself start recognizing there was something different. And you mentioned two of you guys were adopted. Yes. Yes. When did when did, when did you start to wonder about your biological? parents did, did, was it ever brought up by your adopted parents did your siblings say anything about it or what was that spark that you said i'm going to ask or who asked first well i've known about the adoption ever since i was old enough to understand my parents were open from the get-go about all of that mm -hmm. uh when i was a kid to be honest with you andre i didn't really care I, I i honestly i was happy i had loving family members it didn't really bother me at all right. and i never really uh, wanted to look uh for my biological family until i got older and as i got older and i had a daughter of myself then I started thinking a little bit more about it. You know, now you're curious, you know, gosh, you know, what were they like? Am I like them? Do I look like them? And then you get even older and then you worry about, you know, backgrounds and health, right? And, uh, you know, are they still alive? Are, you know, do they have health issues that I have to worry about as I age, right? So um, not until I was in my 50s did I even start to look for them because now we have more means to be able to find things, right? All these, you know, ancestry, 23 and me, all right. these DNA components. You know, at one point I thought I was going to hire a private investigator, but it just, I found it to be expensive at the time. And I didn't want to, I just didn't do it until the uh, DNA stuff came about. But what was the, what was the main trigger though? Because it didn't bother you. And no. I, I guess I'm a, a, a believer that, okay, it may not bother you now, when you're young, it may not bother you. When when I say when we're in our 20s, we're kind of young and reckless in our 20s yeah. and 30s. Then all of a sudden in the 30s, maybe stuff starts to, to, to click. I mean, what was that clicking moment that you said, I'm really wondering here? It started clicking for me when I was in my 40s a little bit. And as I was raising my daughter, um, and she was a teenager at the time, I was curious to maybe think about, well, gee, what's going, what happened with my birth family? Should I know of anything that my daughter and I need to be aware of as we right. you know what I mean from health and, you know, whether it's physical, mental health and things of that nature. 
And like I said, I looked into it from, you know, to a private investigation team. And um, the state of New York has what's co called closed adoption. So it's it's okay. much harder to find all those details. And my and my um, parents didn't really have a tremendous amount of information on where they got me from. They had a little bit. So right. I kind of pushed it to the side. And then as I got in my 50s, I took a trip to Greece. We talked about this, right? And when right. I was there, I was with my best friend and her husband and her husband's from Greece. And he said to me, he goes, you know, he says in his accent, you know, Lorraine, you look Greek to me, you know? And I said, well, I think I'm Italian and Polish. That's what I grew up thinking. Right, right. So what me thinking to find out what, so I did Ancestry.com and I found out I was uh, definitely mostly Italian, and I also had some Eastern European in me, so I didn't know what that really meant, but I didn't find any, you know, family members that were really close, you know, third, fourth, fifth cousins and things like that. Nobody responded to my emails. So then last year, I'm sitting at the uh, dining room table with a couple friends of mine, and they were telling me a story about their stepmom who found her birth father through 23andMe. And okay. as they're telling me the story and showing me the app on the phone, I literally pulled out my phone and I ordered the kit right in front of them. I said, yeah, let me try that. You know, I have an instinct. It was an instinctive, you know, snap decision, which sometimes I do. You know what I make? I made snap decisions sometimes. <laughs> okay. uh, other times they're thought out. But this, in this case, it was like a trigger. So I sent in the sample. I went um, home for the holidays, came back. And when I got the results... I found that they, the, I was um, Italian, mostly Italian, 70 something percent. Then I saw German and Irish and I'm like, oh, my God, I haven't celebrated St. Patrick's Day like a like a champ in all these 55 <laughs> years. What's wrong? So I found a, a, a connection with a, a DNA match with a woman who was really close. And it said first cousin uh, once removed. I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's the closest right. I've ever gotten. I contact her. Long story short, she is the great niece of my birth mother. And that is how I found her literally in one day. And wow. she responded right away. And we have been in touch. We've met a couple times and speak. How did you find her on social media? What's that? How did you find her on social media? No. Uh, so her great niece that I connected with um, put us together. We exchanged emails and we started communicating via email for a while. And then we, you know, shared uh, phone numbers and FaceTimed one another. And I went out there in February of this past year and met her for the very first time in Las Vegas. So now the, the Pandora box is being open. You're getting excited. You get, how, how do you now get introduced to your mom? So, I mean, we introduced one, well, through the uh, the Great Niece Connection, we introduced one another and we got to know each other quite a bit before we met in person, you know, through email exchange, talking on the telephone and things of that nature. And I didn't see her until I met her for the first time. And that was her request. She wanted our first visual encounter to be in person, not via oh. any kind of social media or right or, or FaceTime or anything like that. Um, and it, I went there with a, a birth cousin of mine that happens to live down in Florida half the year. So strange how all that uh, worked out. And her and I went on this trip together because it's her great aunt, it's her aunt, and she went to go see her with me. And it was absolutely wonderful. It was a fabulous experience. I was a little nervous because you hear about some of these folks that meet their birth family and either it's positive or it's negative, right? Somebody doesn't want to be bothered or, uh, but in this case, it was uh welcomed with warm arms and i was really excited uh, to be part of that and still to this day so we've met twice in person and we talk all the time and um i really got to learn so much about her which in turn helped me learn more about me what's the first thing that you tell somebody that's your biological parent that you haven't seen in almost 40 years well, 55 how years. do you even start a conversation yeah you know like what was the conversation when you first met? What was her first reply once she heard from you? Basically, oh my God, I finally found you. Um, and she had shared that she had tried to find me a few years back and she had hired somebody to do so and wound up got getting scammed, you know, out of some money. 
So she was just, you know, kind of just resigned herself to the fact that, oh my goodness, well, you know, I have my memories and all this other stuff. I don't, and, and didn't think that it would ever happen. She was ecstatic, but she took it upon herself to explain to me everything that happened, all the reasons for the adoption. Um, she talked to me about my birth father and I got, I got clarity and understanding of how everything came to be and how I was able to be adopted by my family and what happened to her after that, what, what, what paths she took. Uh, after that happened and in her entire story and she was so open with telling me everything it was lovely to hear you know it's funny because uh, Andre one of the things I did before I met her is I went through all of my photos that I've had since I was six months old mm -hmm. and I put and I and I cut made copies of them you know and I put them in a little photo album and I handed it to her as a gift when I was there so she can see me growing up it choked oh, up well, that I say her. Um, it was just it was love. I couldn't believe her face. Imagine not being able to raise somebody, you know, doesn't matter the reasons. And then you have a book in front of you that takes you from six months to 55 years old uh, that you can go through and order and, and see and see the child growing up and how she grew up. What was what was three of the most impactful parts of your mom's conversation that still today resonate because you didn't go there with judgmental eyes no went there to understand who you are as a, as as a human being yeah and absolutely. clearly you bought you bought joy to a lady that did try to reach out to the best of her ability based on age and yeah. information that she had but out of, now that you you've met her from Brooklyn all the way to Florida now. Why you left Greece, I have no idea, but that's a whole, <laughs> different, whole different topic. Yeah. But what's the three most impactful things out of her opening up to you that you remember the most that you will always carry? Well, I think the first thing is I realized where my personality came from. The more I got to know her, and speak to her, the more I realize we are very similar as far as our mannerisms, our energy, our personality, our creative side. You know, I'm a writer, obviously, so is she. She's artistic, I'm not, and uh, creative, but not artistic. And also there's a sense of um, instinctive clairvoyancy, for lack of better words, that she has. And I always felt that, um, that there was some kind of instinctive nature about myself that I couldn't really explain, not psychic or anything like that, but uh, very instinctive, very spiritual, you know, believing in the universal energy, spirit right. guides. And a lot of people that I know, other than a couple of friends, probably think I'm a little nuts when I talk about it, but she didn't. She shared that. She's very transparent. She's she's very into astrology and studying, you know, stars and, uh, you know, birth dates. She does birth charts. And she made me when I went there and my cousin a beautiful painting that captured my essence before she even met me. Really? And it, it, it was called the healer of hearts. She calls me healer of hearts. And, and it was all purple, which is my aura and my color and with a heart in the middle that kind of, uh, and I have it wrapped up in, um, in storage right now for to put up when I buy my new home and I'm gonna display it, it was so wonderful. So that was a big part of understanding more about who I am personality wise, definitely came from her. I also felt like, you know, she totally understood me. Uh, she even had my birth certificate with my original name on it that she really? named me and handed that to me. She shared jewelry with me from her mother, who I was named after. And she also told me a little bit about my birth father, who I look just like. And it was it was helpful to me to be able to see, you know, because because although I don't really look like her, we have similar eyes. I look more like birth dad. And unfortunately, he passed away uh, almost two years ago now. And I never got a chance to meet him. And he didn't even know about me. So mm -hmm. it was it, it was it was good to at least know that. Right. and um, have a sense of understanding 
uh, and I felt like I accomplished what I needed to. And I still am uh, enjoying the relationship. And this lady even called my mother and my stepmom and has developed a relationship with the two of them as well over the phone, on FaceTime. And my family's so happy that I found her, which was so nice to have that support. Now, you a mother yourself, two daughters. Yes. Who was the first person that you shared this joyous moment with? My and daughter you just found daughter. out you said it with your daughter. What was their response? You know, she was very happy for me. Initially, she was a little skeptical because, you know, people, you know, she's like has the eyes of, all right, is somebody trying to pull the wool over your eyes? Are you sure mm -hmm. that this is the right? You know what I mean? Are you sure mm -hmm. that this is the person? Because, you know, people hear about scams all the time and and folks, you know, acting like they're certain people to get something from somebody. So the her first thing was protecting her mom, you know, and and making sure that nobody was trying to do anything wrong to me. And, and then when I showcased to her that that's not the case, she was really happy for me um you know there's a you know she was raised she's very close to uh me she's very close to her grandparents and you know so she has that sense of loyalty to them so she was glad that i had uh, developed this relationship and continue to to this day um and she's just a smiling and happy for me for a di from a distance that sounds so delightful yeah i could just imagine what she must be going through to finally get to see and embrace her her daughter yeah with that said what's next for you what did you get out of that what's the next journey now that you from brooklyn to naples greece <laughs> <laughs> what's next what's next so i am in the process of writing a book called girls from brooklyn and the book is going to be a novel that is based on the story of finding my birth mom and taking that whole uh, detail of based on a true story and turning it into a fictional novel. So I am halfway done with that right now. And I just, as we're writing it, I'm saying, wow, it's becoming such an amazing journey that again based on a true story but certainly has some you know fictional directions in it from you know powers and clairvoyancy and i tell people i'm like it's kind of got to be my story right. married with harry potter so that's all i'll tell you right now so i'm excited to get that accomplished and share that with everybody for inspiration and also entertainment um and 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 belief in something i never thought this was going to happen especially at age 55 i was like wow you know it's, i'm so glad that i was able to get this accomplished while at least she was still here you know right, i right. could have found her and, and and her not be with us any longer so there's a reason for everything what do you tell the viewers now like in in a in a in a quick summary and if somebody's in that situation how do how do you navigate them to 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 keep moving forward to maybe finding out who their parents are or somebody that might have been in that same situation that you're in yeah so whether it's trying to look for you know your birth family or whether it's trying to accomplish a task or you know make one of your dreams come true regret is the hardest thing that you're going to have to ever live with sometimes people are scared to make you know decisions or take chances or go find something oh my gosh if i do that i'm afraid what i'm going to find well i think you'll be more fearful if you don't do things if you don't take chances and if you are looking for biological family members for whatever your own reasons there's so much out there to help you right now i'd say 23 and me was just unbelievable that it was able to allow me to find this uh, you know for myself for her and there's so many other family members that i didn't even know i had that i've become close with as a result of this too so take chances take a quantum leaf leap don't necessarily hide behind what ifs and and fear uh, because you know throughout my life even through other things that i've gone through personally and professionally Right. If I did that, I wouldn't be anywhere right now. I'd be under a rock still complaining about what I don't have, you right. know, what, you know, where I'm not, 
right? And I am focusing on all the great things that have happened. And certainly this being one of them, writing The Secrets to Having the Best Team Ever. That's another book that I'm writing right now, along with some amazing mentors that have been wonderful and team members I've worked with too. So building relationships, communicating with people that matter and helping others and bringing them value along the way, right. no matter what your dreams and aspirations are, take the chance, make the decision. Now, I didn't ask this question, but I think I'm going to ask now before we wrap up. Sure. Were there moments that you were afraid? And if you were, what were those moments? Hmm. Um, what comes to mind, number one, I, you get fearful. Gosh, when I first had my daughter, you know, and, you know, fearful that you're going to be, you know, am I going to be a good parent? You know, I have to keep this little baby alive, right? And grow her up and now she's 31 with a baby of her own, and, and that's just a miracle. But certainly it's scary to be a parent, but also a very rewarding. And another thing is, too, is I've been an independent person for most of my adult life. Right. You know, I've been pretty entrepreneurial. I've been in corporate America. I've been involved in non-for-profit things and established a lot of friends. And sometimes when a curveball is thrown at you that you didn't expect mm -hmm. derailing you from your train, that's scary because sometimes you don't know that you are supposed to be derailed and put you in a different direction. And part of the reason I'm even here talking to you and part of the reason that I'm even focusing on these books that I've written or am writing is because I got derailed off that train and because I was scared. So sometimes there's a reason for everything. <laughs> I like the way you said that. How can the viewers reach out to you? Um, so I have a website. It's uh, cpclorraine.com, and it showcases all the different things I'm working on, including the books, my coaching and consulting for mortgage and sales professionals, personal professional development. Or I would love for you to send me an email at coachlorraine2014 at gmail.com, and I'd be happy to help anybody that would like to get in touch with me uh, reach their potential and their dreams. Lorraine, leave the viewers with something positive, because clearly... Clearly, you walk in a positive universe and you let very little negativity come into that space. And when it does come in, you have the power somehow to turn it into something good. Leave the viewers with something positive before we leave out. You know, one of the greatest things that you can do for yourself and others is be true to who you are. Don't try to be anybody else. And don't let anybody derail you from your direction because only you can add value to yourself and others by being the very, very best version of yourself. So never stop personal professional development on who you are. It's going to lead you in amazing place. And this has been another exciting episode of the Angel to Peace. Great news.